Well, good morning, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, it's quite interesting, yesterday when Nong was uh, introducing everybody, or rather getting everybody to put up their hands and say who they are and where they are from, uh, he forgot to mention or didn't realize that I was in the room. And so I'm from uh, District 9350, um, uh, Rotary Club of Newlands. I was a bit off, I should have stuck my hand up and said, Hello, I could have, <laughs> I'm here as well. Um, so, so, greetings from 9350 and, uh, and Rotary Club of Newlands. And uh, you can probably forgive me later when we stump you later this afternoon. Um, for those non-rugby people, that was a rugby joke. So, interesting thing happened a while ago. I was speaking at our district assembly, and Patrick uh, Chisanga uh, was our keynote speaker. And he opened the, the meeting uh, with an interesting, very moving tribute to a DG, a PDG, that had just died a couple of days before. And I'm very new in Rotary. Um, I'm a, literally a baby Rotarian. When Nong said yesterday, um, Okay, who's, who's been here two years and less? I actually was too ashamed to put my hand up because that was me. <laughs> I only joined Rotary in, uh, 20, 20, in October 2020. Um, and so, anyway, so Patrick started... I also get my timing right here. Right. So I know how long I've got to speak. Uh, this little robot thing you've got isn't going to work for me. If you've already worked out, I can't see. So... If somebody can give me a ping five minutes before the end, I'd be grateful. All right, so Patrick opened up by giving a tribute to somebody who had died, a PDG. And, you know, I, I was listening, and suddenly oh, this name came out, and I realized I remembered, I knew him well once, and it was a man called Rodney Mazinta. And I don't know if there's any old-timers here who remember Rodney as a PDG down in 9350. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody here was his classmate or something. And um, what's significant about the story is that Rodney gave me my first job uh, back in 1990. Now, it wasn't my actual first job. Um, I had, in fact, already, I was already working, but the job I had wasn't exactly a career-fulfilling job. And that was, I was a switchboard operator until Rodney gave me an opportunity. And, and I suppose it's better that I give you a bit of background. So, as you know, I can't see. And some years ago, many years ago, when I was a young, well, when I was a youngster, in fact, I was born with severe myopia, very poor vision. Um, but it meant I had some vision, a little bit of vision. And there's something interesting about people when they start thinking about, well, they don't really think much about it, but when they... In confronted with the blind phenomenon. They tend to want to think in binaries. They think either can see or can't. And it really isn't like that at all. The, you know, out of the 280 million blind people in the world, 20, only 25% are totally blind. The rest have some partial sight. And I was just like that. So what it meant was I could ride a bicycle, but I would never be able to drive a car. I could read large print. Now, I'm talking about when I was a youngster. I could read large print, but I would never be able to read a newspaper size print or a telephone book. I could see the mountain uh, in Cape Town, not, not here, uh, in Cape Town. <laughs> but I would never have been able to see the waterfalls on the mountain or any other feature of the mountain. And I would be able to see a person standing in front of me, you know, five, six feet away, but I wouldn't be able to see a person ten feet away. So it's very interesting um, to try and understand visual impairment. Even when you're having it yourself, it's tricky enough, let alone you guys who are trying to scratch your head about this. Anyway, so I went through a mainstream school, and it wasn't particularly easy. Uh, they struggled, I struggled, and we muddled through, and I graduated, I finished school, and I went to university, and I studied beer, mostly. Um, <laughs> um, and I graduated and then I hit the world of work and it was like hitting a wall because you can always muddle through you know as a visually impaired person you know there's people will accommodate you here and there but hitting the world of work was another story entirely and I remember spending 1988 
uh, walking the road flat looking for a job. With my degree in public administration and a half major in personnel management, um, I didn't tell them about the beer, um, and nobody was interested in this funny visually impaired guy who held the form up right up to his nose to try and fill it in. And I had to eat, and I was offered a position as a switchboard operator in the Navy, which is very common. All over the world, a very common position for, for blind people is, in fact, switchboard operation. And I, um, I, had, a, I had a choice to make. You know, it's not exactly a difficult job. It's, it's a switchboard, for heaven's sake. It's, hello, Silver Mine, Navy Base, or Silver Mine, Navy Base, hello. That's about it. <laughs> in two languages, you know, and it's not difficult. I had a choice. I could have been arrogant and, oh, God, this isn't my job, and I hate this, and why am I here, and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I, I realized it's, this is very easy, and I realized very quickly that I had a gift, and that I had a, a nice telephone voice and a nice way of speaking on the phone. And I realized it was like a weapon almost. Oh, I could get away with murder with my phone, my phone ability. And I could flirt shamelessly on the phone. And um, so there was a, a wrong number one day. And I, um, I, I really, you know, I wasn't so much enjoying it in the sense of a career, but I was enjoying it because it was easy and because it was fun actually getting to grips with everything around it learning the numbers and that sort of thing. And I got this a wrong number one day. And a woman was looking for a particular place, which happened to be in our environment, had nothing to do with the Navy, and I happened to know what their number was. She said, oh, I'm looking for the Time and Stone Lighthouse. And I said, okay, there's nothing to do with us, but I do know their number. And I said this in a flirty, nice, chirpy way. <laughs> and she listened to me and she said, you know, you've got a wonderful voice on the phone. And I said, thank you. And she said, I run a, a training, what I run, I work for a training company and we have a little call center and we need sales done. And she said, would you apply for a job? And I said, sure. So I, I pulled a sickie the next day, I didn't go to work. <laughs> and um, she, she hired me on the spot. And then she said, I'd like you to meet our managing director and there was Rodney Mazinta. Now he was concerned about the vision thing as any boss would be, how are you going to manage, what are you going to do, what can we do for you? But the point is, is that he doubled in diversity by giving me that opportunity. And to short circuit the long story, um, 10 years later I started my own business as a, market, as a marketer of HR services, uh, discovered disability as a product and a niche because the Employment Equity Act had come out. And uh, the next 23 years, I spent uh, specializing in diversity, equity, and inclusion, but with a focus on disability, which is, after all, the long-lost cousin of diversity. And uh, in 2020, I was asked to join Rotary, and I had no knowledge of Rotary before, and I like writing, I write, I write quite a lot. And my articles got picked up by Rotary Africa and then by Rotary Voices in the States. And then I got, a, you know, I got an email from somebody saying, you know, would you like to participate in the webinar? And that was one of Peter's best friends, Peter Kyle's best friends, a chap called Mark Wafer. And his wife, of course, is a director with Peter. And they fairly newly established diversity, equity and inclusion committee or task force, to give it more of a powerful name and they invited me to participate, or rather to be on the task force. So none of that would have happened if Rodney hadn't dabbled in diversity. So that's really how, how it can work. Now what is diversity and what are we doing here with this issue of diversity? And so there's an acronym, there's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, D, E and I. And there's a lot of consternation about why we suddenly need this focus on diversity. What is it all about? Um, and it's, there's a very interesting thing about diversity is that what I've noticed spending the last 23 years in diversity work is that it's clearly focused largely on race and gender and a little bit of LGBT but very rarely is it adequately dealt with from a disability point of view so 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about diversity, equity and inclusion, but from a disability angle, because it is, after all, the element of diversity that is least known about. And so I just consider it as an analogy, not a replacement of the other two things, three things or four things that are covered by diversity traditionally. And so, what is diversity? And diversity is difference, essentially. Anybody who is different, so to a, to a man, a woman, would be diversity, different. To a gay person, a straight person would be different. Um, so, if you're white, black would be different. So, that's essentially what diversity is. It's not rocket science. Most of the diversity issue is, in fact, common sense. Now, the thing about diversity and embracing diversity is that it's difficult because we don't handle diversity well. We don't handle... Um, we don't handle change well. We struggle with change. And we tend to resist what we don't understand. Um, and we tend to keep at arm's length what we don't understand and what makes us uncomfortable. Now think about how we handled HIV AIDS in this country 25 years ago. We made a complete hash of HIV. We cocked it up spectacularly in this country. And nobody will deny that. We lost an entire decade and countless thousands of people unnecessarily because we were frightened of it, because we resisted the knowledge which would have empowered us to deal with it properly. And we're not going to go into why. We all know exactly why that happened. But the point is that's what happens when you are uncomfortable about something and you're not, um, you're not confident enough to, to get closer. And the thing about issues along diversity or anything that you are, one, uncomfortable about and two, don't know much about, you tend to have an arm's length relationship rather than get closer. You tend to avoid rather than embrace. And that's the challenge. And that's our big challenge. And because we do that, we don't engage. One of the most important words of diversity, equity and inclusion is engagement. And particularly around the issue around disability. Now disability has been dealt with in society for millennia in a similar sort of way. We call it the medical model now, um, looking backwards. And essentially, we call it the medical model because it's seen as a biological aberration. It's seen as something's wrong. Something in your body is broken. And as a result, you cannot do things. Um, I noticed somebody was hovering behind me while I was climbing the stairs. And because I did, in fact, miss the top step, which wouldn't, wasn't tragic, but I noticed somebody was, and I suspected it was Sylvia, and I told you not to do that, but... <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine. But... So what we, so the medical model says, you know what, there's something wrong. Okay, let's in this case me, if you're blind, you're visually impaired, whatever. And so you can't do certain things. And so we've, we've, we've perpetuated this medical model for literally countless generations. Too many generations to count. And we've treated disability in a particular way, as a victim, as somebody who can't do stuff. And so there's automatic assumptions of what we are able to do. And because we don't engage, we don't know any different. And what the medical model also did was persuaded us to, in fact, artificially separate ourselves, which is why so many institutions were created around disability, us and them. And that's what, we, that's what we're coming out of. Then about 50 odd years ago, the paradigm started changing. And we started realizing that it wasn't the disability that was doing, that was causing the difficulties. It was the barriers that persons with disabilities were encountering that were actually preventing them from accessing mainstream society. And it was a little quick story was a chap came back from the Vietnam War in the States and he was paralyzed from a spinal cord injury and he came back straight after the, well, right at the time of an election. In 1972, and he wanted to vote in his town in America somewhere, and he couldn't. Why? Because the polling station was in a school, 
And just as like our schools in those days, the schools would have been largely inaccessible. And so, of course, he couldn't vote. And so he sued his town, being a, a, a traditional American, very litigious, he sued his town. And he won. Because nobody could think of a good reason why, in fact, he couldn't vote. Because it was clear that it was the inaccessibility that was preventing him from voting, not his spinal cord injury. And so the paradigm started shifting, and we call this new paradigm the social model, where we, what we need to look at are the barriers, not the disabilities. And so my first invitation to you is to stop fixating on disabilities. That's not the game. Start looking at the barriers. You can do nothing about the disabilities. Look at me. You can do absolutely nothing for me and my sight, and lack of sight. Okay? Um, you can't unblind me. But what you can do is pay attention to barriers and remove them, or plan to remove them, and identify them to be removed and budgeted to be removed. And that's the smart money. And so the social model is where we're at now. The trouble is, is that we're all adults in this room, and we were all brought up in the medical model, and so you're still thinking in the past about disability, which is why your relationship with disability is so tricky. Because you're still stuck in the old paradigm. It's not your fault. It's the, it's the way you were brought up. Um, because we were all brought up like that. And so we need to shift into the new social model paradigm and stop fixating on disabilities and start looking at barriers. Now here's the important thing. Is that we need to... Um, we need to embrace that the, in the, the principles of diversity, equity and inclusion... Is that, is that my tone that I asked for? No? Uh, that was a phone. <laughs> um, the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, those three words, those three um, acronyms, or those three letters rather. So we've got diversity, we've dealt with that now. Now we've got equity. Now equity and equality are not the same thing. Okay, equality would be give, providing a room in a hotel like everyone else. Equity is where you go into the room and show the blind guy where the shampoo is as opposed to the hand sanitizer. Imagine how much fun it would have been this morning squeezing hand sanitizer <laughs> on what little hair I have left. And so that's e equity and e equality is providing everybody with the same chicken dish at lunch. Equity is allowing the blind guy to eat it with his fingers because it's very difficult to navigate chicken on the bone with a knife and fork when you can't see. So equity and e equality are different things. And where, equity is all about accommodation. Really, I don't mean a roof over your head, accommodation in the concept of reasonable accommodation. What can we do to ensure? So equity, equality is providing everybody with a table in this room. Equity is helping me find my table. And so there we have equity. Now we have inclusion and this is the big deal. This is the big deal. Is we need to embrace the social model in order, in order to be able to inspire inclusion. And this is where Rotary comes in. So, wonderful, wonderful saying by a CEO about 20 odd years ago. His name was Sir Peter Bonfield. He was the head of British Telecom at the time. And he said, probably the smartest statement around diversity I've ever heard. Companies that fail to embrace diversity, including disability, as a core business issue, are simply missing the point. Let me say it again. Companies that fail to embrace diversity, including disability, as a core business issue, are simply missing the point. And so we must include disability into the diversity equation for a very simple reason. Not only because it is the world's largest minority, with 1.3 billion people in the world having some form of disability or other, but it's, one of the, it's the only form of diversity I suppose from an LGBT, but that can also grow and people can change, that's true. But it's one of the few elements of diversity which grows in the sense that you could, there is nothing, there are 150 people in this room, there is nothing 
you can do to prevent a disability from happening to you tomorrow. Now, I'm not trying to frighten you. That's how insurance is sold. Insurance is sold on fear. Quickly, quickly, sign here before it happens to you, right? That's insurance. I'm not trying to frighten you. What I am trying to give you is power. And it's power because the knowledge that it could be you provides you with the ability to relate to it. With conventional diversity, we can't relate. Men don't know what the hell's going on with women. That's why we're always fighting. <laughs> Black and white, we can't, as whitey as a white South African, I cannot possibly relate to the experiences of a black South African growing up in apartheid. I can empathize and shout and scream about it, but I can't relate. But when it comes to disability, you absolutely can relate, because it absolutely can be you. And so the next time you encounter an issue around disability, and you think to yourself, I don't have enough knowledge, I don't know what to do, I'm frightened to come up to them, I don't know what... You do have enough knowledge. It's in your head already. Because it could be you, you simply have to say to yourself, this could be me, God knows this could be me. And what would I expect if it was me? And then you do that thing. And trust me, you'll do the right thing. Because if it was you, you wouldn't have wanted anything else. And so, that's our challenge. Now in Rotary, and I, as a newbie, I'm very nervous to say this, because I know so little about Rotary, even though I've, you know, I've, I've, followed, I've, I've watched things closely. But there's no question that Rotary has done an enormous amount for persons with disabilities. But have they really, from an inclusion point of view? I was speaking to a gentleman the other night about the 40,000 wheelchairs, Francis, about 40,000 wheelchairs brought in. And that's terrific. That's terrific. But how close are we? Let me tell you a little story. So I met a, a man once in a Rotary meeting on Zoom. Are you muted? <laughs> and he said, um, he was telling us about a basketball team that they sponsor, a club of his. And he was waxing lyrical about how, what they've done. They found the kit for them. They found a venue for them. They helped them get into competi competition. And they're very proud of their wheelchair basketball team. And I said to him, so how many of those wheelchair basketball players are employed? He said, I didn't know. I said, how many of those wheelchair basketball players are in tertiary education? He didn't know. I said, how many of those wheelchair basketball players are rotor actors or rotarians? And he didn't know. Because that's our challenge in Rotary is that, and I'm not picking on Rotary, any, I hate the word charity, I really do, I can't think of an analogy or a different way of putting it, but any organization like Rotary tends to look, and I'm talking historically here, and I've, I've done my 10,000 hours, so I've, I've got a bit of experience under my belt. We tend to look at disability as a victim and as a potential beneficiary of our charity. We need to look at disability differently. We need to look at disability about how can we partner with them more. Are we seeing the disability and just giving, or are we embracing the idea that that's an individual who could in fact contribute? And this is borne out by the fact that I'm the only blind rights Rotarian in my district. And I wouldn't be surprised if I was the only blind Rotarian in this district too. And even if there are ten others, that's too few. There's a million blind people in this country. We're not all poor. We're not all absolutely broke or, you know, poverty-stricken or stuck in some, you know, hellhole because we can't get out. Why is that? Why don't we, in fact, find the head of marketing in a large insurance company that exists, the two actuaries who are blind, the countless lawyers, the 25 advocates, the countless IT providers. Why is it we don't find them and make them? It's because we're not comfortable. And let me end with a story. Actually, two things. I know I'm getting close to my time. Forgive me. But there's two things I want to do. Is consider... Consider disability when we say our favorite creed in Rotary. Of the things we say and do, think, say and do. Is it the truth? Now what I would unpack it. When someone says, oh yeah, my venue is accessible. Is it? Inquire, interrogate. 
Is my website accessible? Is my entire rotary digital infrastructure accessible? And they, they, I, the developers will say, yeah, 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 inquires. Is it the truth? Secondly, is it fair to all concerned? How, how can it be fair when we're excluding so many? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Well, how sad if so many that are excluded can't in fact benefit from that goodwill and better friendships. Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Well, if we're excluding, we can't, it can't possibly be. Now let me end with a little story. So, it's, remember what I said about barriers and, and our aversion to embracing diversity is like a wall. So let me end with a story about a wall. So picture a mental a cross between a mental institution and a jail. And if you're thinking one flew over the cuckoo's nest, you're showing your age. Um, so something like that. And there's two inmates, a man and a woman. And the man says to the woman, we've got to escape. We've got to get out of here. And the woman says, absolutely, I hate it here. And the man says, I've got a plan. And the woman says, terrific, what can I do? And he says, right. In the next week, I want you to find as much food as we can, and I want you to get some warm clothing, because when we escape, I don't want to starve, and I don't want to freeze. And she looked at him, and she said, what are you going to do? And he says, no, no, I'm going to look at the wall, and I'm going to establish whether, if the wall is over six foot, then we'll go under it. And if it is under six foot, we'll go over it. We'll meet in a week. And so they did. A week later... They arrive, uh, they arrive together and the woman says, have you done your research? He said, yes. Have you got your food? Have you got your blankets? Have you got the clothing? And she said, yep. We're not going to starve. We're not going to freeze. And she looks at him and she says, and you? What have you found out? He says, I've got terrible news. I've looked and looked, but there is no wall. So we're stuck here forever. 